No worries. Welcome to this Cycling Life Racing Bites. We have a special episode today, and I'm delighted to be joined by former professional uh, Alan Davis. Alan needs no introduction. He had over 50 wins during his 12 year professional career. And one of his podiums was the Milan San Remo, which is what we're going to talk about today. In 2007, uh, Alan got the ball rolling for the Aussies. Up to that point in history, no Australian had finished on the podium um, of Milan San Remo. Uh, Alan did so, and that was later followed by Matt Goss and Simon Guerin's success. So, Alan, over to you. Maybe we can start, actually, by just talking about um, the 2007 season, you were riding for Discovery Channel. How did you prepare for Milan San Remo? Yeah, hello, Jamie and everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on uh, The Cycling Life. It's, uh, it's good to be on the other side of the, the microphone for, a, for a something different, mate. But uh, yes, yeah, so we have uh, Milan San Remo on the horizon this week, as we all know, with the changing of the dates. So it was... Uh, it's uh, something that's a topic of, of uh, discussion at the moment, especially amongst the professionals. Um, in 2007, I was riding with the Discovery Channel team, and I was lucky enough to get uh, second uh, that year in Milan San Remo. So uh, yeah, it was kind of it was kind of like a before uh, story to it. You know, as a young rider, it kind of was a race that really stuck out to me. Um, that really grab my attention and thought that it really suited my characteristics as a like an under 23 and AIS rider going through the system. So it was one that I really had on the radar for since since a young age. So it was really nice to, to accomplish a dream on that day. I mean the length of the race of course is is legendary. Um, what what sort of special training did you do leading into it, Alan? Yeah, so it, it kind of starts the preparation starts uh, for me, it always started uh, in November, Jamie. So, um, sort of the off, the going into the off season the year before. Um, for me, uh, the Milan San Remo was always my World Championships of the of the spring, and then we had this, the you know the World Championships later on in the year. But uh, as I said before, it really suited my characteristics. So, my my training and my coaching and my preparation was always evolved around hitting some good form around that time of year in the start of May, sorry, the start of March. Yeah. Um, so it started in November. Uh, we got in the gym like we do with you, mate. We do a really good base season, you know, base um, phase. We do like uh, eight weeks of the uh, gym and just light, light uh, you know, low intensive uh, riding and just other sports. And then we sort of move into December and that's when I started to really do some long Ks uh, top up, you know, what I'd really done years before as well, like we mentioned on other pod, uh, previous webinars, you know, mm-hmm. it's just sort of topping up the base again. So, And, and Ellen, is it, is it, you know, given, given the duration of it, you know, like over what, 300 kilometres, to what extent do you think it's really necessary to do rides of that sort of length ahead of the race? You know, some people say you don't really need to do the full length. Others say you should do it. What, what was your take on that? Yeah, it's an interesting one, mate, because, you know, we, we would never do that length in training. Um, you know, you do, you know, I'll do up to six hours, for example, that can kind of be my longest training ride. Like I, like I mentioned, in December, you'd start the, the longer, low-intensive riding. And then January, you're, in Australia, mate, you're, you're doing the national titles, you're doing the Tour Down Under, you're doing quite a few, uh, you know, the Bay Crits, if you're doing that as well. So January is quite intense as well. So you kind of use that as the intensive phase of your training and then you head to Europe and then you know it all starts so I used to really use the racing as my intensive and distance training so I always perform better doing the Treno Adriatico which is the week leading into Milan San Remo yeah and that was sort of you know you, you did a seven day stage race a week out or 10 days out a couple of days I'd do an extra extra an hour after after the stage just to really consistently have a a really solid base there leading into it. And then it's freshening up for a few days and then you're ready to go yep. come Saturday. 
And heading into the race, maybe we can talk about the race itself. Um, you were with Discovery Channel at that time. Uh, w- were you the protected rider? Was it, was it you from, from the start that the, the team was there to ride for you? And, and then who were your teammates in the race? Yeah, so um, actually the Tour of California was in February back in those days. So uh, I went, you know, obviously being an American team, it was quite important. So I went there in February and that one sort of, like I said, train ride directico. So I kind of started to get a couple of results straight off the off the bat with uh, California. So it sort of gave me a, a bit of a, a leadership role within the team for that race, Milan San Remo. Um, uh, Yakuzlav Popovich was another rider that we had in the team who had really good form and had a really good, uh, you know, uh, classic one day ability on his day. So he was another sort of team leader. So him and I sort of shared the roles for, for team discovery on, on that day. Yeah. And then heading into the race, I mean, it is again, as I mentioned, you know, legendary for the, for the length. Um, what was your race plan and, and how did that un- unfold in terms of the first half and then the second half of the race? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the biggest, it's a, it's a really beautiful race, Milan San Remo, you know, obviously, like you said, mate, the biggest uh, topic to the race is the length of the, the race, you know, you're well over six hours of, of riding, um, so you really need to be performing, know how to teach your body to, to perform after six hours, basically, so, you know, the day before, you're just eating, constantly eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're trying to get as much energy in as possible. Um, you know, even right up to the morning of, you know, the race starts at nine in the morning. So you're up at six, six o'clock getting the pasta and omelets and just trying to get as much fuel in as possible. And then once you get to the start line, it's, uh, it's you know, my, my way I took it was, was really conservative. I always had like a conservative approach to it. And then, you know, just trying to save as much energy as I could until I got to, you know, that last 40 car of the race when the, yeah. the copy, the, the really short climbs along the coast there start. And then, uh, you know, you take all the warm gear off and then the race starts and you know, hopefully yeah. you've got a bit left when the Poggio comes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, these days when we talk about energy conservation, of course, you got the numbers. I mean, were you racing with SRMs then? Were you able just to keep an eye on your normalised power, kind of how, how you were saving your energy or was it really based on feeling? I, um, at that time, SRM and power meters were really big in training, I would say. Uh, yeah. race, race day, we had just the normal, you know, speedos or uh, was, was sort of the norm back then. But uh Definitely used it in training and preparation, mate. Yeah. And then on race day, I would really be constant, personally constant on using really good cadence like we speak about quite often. You know, yeah. just really saving my glycogen stores. Good cadence when the, when the opportunity arrived. You know, sometimes it would be quite hard. Um, you go over to Aquino Climb, which is actually nine kilometres halfway through the race. People forget about that. So it is a really fairly long climb in the race. Yeah. So you really want to go up there as, as energy saving as possible. When you get off the other side of that, you kind of get down onto the coast. And that's when you really want to have, uh, you know, if you're going to have a, a good day or a bad day, so to speak, you know, you, you kind of into the 180k mark of the race, which is a, quite a long way in a normal race, but right. you would have saved a lot of energy by then. And then, you know, the race really kicks up then. And the, yeah. the guys get on the front from the teams and start to bring back the breakaway that's on... Normally, there's a breakaway in, in France, so this pace really starts to really starts to get high after that point, mate. After after that 100 and 180, you said, and and up to 180, were, were, were you chit chatting? Were you uh, were you being sociable, or were you were you conserving your energy completely by just staying to yourself? Because Alan, you like a good chat, mate. I mean, I know you're a friendly bloke. You always got a sunny disposition. Were you? Was there? Is there a bit of chit chat going on in that first half, or, or guys already got the tunnel vision going to get to the end? Yeah, it's one thing, you know, there is, just to get out of uh, Milan, there's a neutral section of, oh, it must be nearly 10 kilometres or over 10 kilometres. So, yeah. you know, there's a neutral section before the flag drops where the race actually starts. So you're having a good yarn, you know, us, us Aussies always, you'd find us in a group having a good talk. And, yeah. and, um, and then, so you've got, you know, 10, 12K under the belt before the flag drops. And yeah. then, uh, then, then the race goes, you know, it's really quite cold too. Mm. Time of year and the breakaway forms and then kind of everything settles down again then you'll find a group of Aussies 
and you know having a having a yarn and and uh, you know there's a time and place for for relaxing and having a chat and I actually like switching off when I could because it just meant that I could when I had time to switch it back on I was really fr- fresh and ready to go so uh, yeah that uh, so, you, so you had a, so you had a strategy for the banter it was it was to keep your mind relaxed and not be too too much in the in, in the zone there because there were a lot of Aussies in that race I mean we'll come and talk about the finish later but you had McHugh and you had O'Grady so there was a obviously a bunch of Aussies uh, on the road for, for more than six hours. So I'm sure you had a chance to, to catch up with each other. But, um, so tell us, maybe maybe you can just talk us through, say, the last, you know, last stages of the race, the last 10 Ks, particularly heading into the Poggio, because uh, Gilbert and I think it was Rocco attacked at that, at that point. They, they got a gap. What was going through your mind at that point as you were heading, heading towards the finish and, and you hit the Poggio with that attack? Yeah, so... Before the Poggio, Jay, we have um, La, La Chapressa. So that's yeah. really like the start. So you have the Repesha and, the, uh, and then the Poggio. So it's really helpful leather into the bottom of La Chapressa. And then you'll see, you know, this weekend as well, like leading into La Chapressa, you'll see riders sort of, it's sort of, there's a natural formation happening within the bunch, you know. There's guys going out the back. And the guys who have a role to play are trying to stay in the front and the teams are trying to protect them. So it's really, it's, it's like a coming into a sprint, mate. It's, there's yeah. elbows and there's headbutts and, you know, trying to get start of the, the, the front at the bottom of the presser because you go off that and basically back again on the podio. So in our scenario, we had uh, Popovich, like I said, so his card to play was to attack, to follow this yeah. attack. And, uh, and uh, Rico, like you mentioned, Joubert, they, they had the same card to play as well, like many other riders. So he, he had a really good opportunity. So he was attacking with these guys when they went on the Poggio. Yeah. In hindsight, it was good for me because I could see this unfolding. And, you know, that was, that was good for us, you know, because I had an option as well in front. The team had a really good situation to play with, my, with myself, waiting there, just trying to get over the Poggio as best I could, you know, using my cadence and my tactics to try and get out of the wind and then at the same time Popo was off the front you know playing his card so if that guy if, if those guys did get to the finish we had an opportunity for him to get a result as well for the team yeah so it was all it kind of unfolded really well for us on that day yeah it came so back. I mean you had you had Rico and, and Gilbert away as you said um but right beside you I guess you had McEwen you had Bonin were, were their teams responding very quickly to those attacks were you were you able to benefit from that or how, how did that unfold well, like I kind of, the harder the race, the better for me as a cyclist, as a sprinter, so to speak. It kind of took the edge off the, the really quick guys, the really powerful sprinters. So the harder, the hillier at the end was, was sort of more it suited me. And uh, it's uh, so I had beside me, you know, Boon and Pataki, Robbie, all these guys, sprinters, big sprinters with the same card to play as myself. Yeah. So that's just that's just the, the ingredients of the race. We all know it. So um, yeah, it was. Uh, sorry, I just have my son here. <laughs> that's all right. I'm learning how to win San Remo, but uh, he can come, yeah, he can come and give, his, give his two cents worth. Yeah. yeah. Right. So so then uh, I mean you're over over the podium. Did 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 they have much of a gap going over the top? And then how, how did those last kilometers then unfold? Yeah, so they had a bit of a gap. Uh, I think it was like within 10 to 15 seconds over the top. And then there's really um, technical descent before you get back down onto the flat roads and it really uh, straightens out. Um, so I, I was kind of like midfield at that time and uh, just sort of trying to, like I say, recover from the effort up the pod. So everyone gets over it as much as they, in the best way they can, if you're a sprinter or attacker or whatever. Then you get on the descent and you try and just save as much energy as you can left. And then it's not far to the finish. So that was sort of, I was trying to stay upright, you know, take some deep breaths in when I could. There's some really hectic uh, corners where, you, you know, you really have to go fast and close your eyes a bit just yeah. to maintain your position on the, in, the, in the peloton. And then, uh, yeah, then you start thinking about your positioning coming into the sprint. Yeah. And coming into the sprint, I mean, uh, it was the error of uh, Alessandro Patacci. He was one of the other other favourites uh, at the time. He he wound it up. He was the one who who kind of I guess let it out. That you had Freire with you, you had Bourne, and you had McEwen. What was happening in that last sort of five hundred metres? What, what wheels were you following? Were you were you surfing the wheels, moving from one to the other? How, how did that unfold? 
Yeah, well, uh, sort of Popo come, he got caught, my teammate, and he was sort of my the, the last team I'd have had. And he sort of give whatever he could just to get me in in the front of the what was left of the bunch. And like you said, mate, I was surfing the wheels, you know, Pataki had the Milram train. I think there was like six or seven riders of them. So they they really looked like um, they were really in a strong position, you know. So I was keeping an eye on where where he was and sort of just staying around him. And the winner of the race, Oscar Freire as well, you know, he was sort of playing the same card as me. He didn't really have a teammate, but he had the respect of being the past winner that he could just stay on the back of Pataki. And it was really hard to manoeuvre him away from that. So, yeah, I was just basically trying to stay somewhere near the near the sprinters of the of the race and uh, fo- following what teams looked really organised and then uh, try to stay as close as possible to them. Yeah. So it was a close finish. I mean, Freire was a legend. Um, you know, very, you know, not so, a small guy, but incredibly fast and really fast kick. So certainly a well-deserved winner. Um, coming in second and then followed by Bonin, you had uh, Robbie McEwen, I believe, in fourth and Stuart O'Grady in fifth. So... The Aussies that day seemed to be really in the mix. How was the banter afterwards? I mean, clearly you had the podium with the guys, which, which must have been awesome being on the, on the podium with, with the guys, the calibre of Freire and Bonin. Uh, but was there a bit of banter with the Aussies afterwards, given, given that so many of you did finish in that, that top, top elite group? Um, to be honest, you kind of... Uh, the race finishes, there's people everywhere. And I was lucky enough to do the, be on the podium and do the podium. Um, and then you sort of don't see each other. You sort of, you know, it's, it's everyone, everyone's got their own way home. So, um, you know, I'm living in Spain, I'm in the Basque country in the north. Those guys are in Belgium. Yep. I think Stuart was in Monaco, so he just went down the road to home. So, it was, and Twitter and all that sort of stuff wasn't big at the time. So, there wasn't much sort of connection um, yep. until sort of, you know, after the race when the classic start up in Belgium and then everyone yep. sort of congregates there. And, you know, wow, you sort of reflect a little bit, you know, that's, yeah. that's awesome for Australian cycling, you know, three, three Aussies in the top five of, of a monument. It's uh, never happened before. Right, and uh, yeah. and reflecting back on it, Alan, I mean, of course, second was, was, was awesome. Um, and, you know, but, but some people will say that, you know, third is better than second because, you know, third, you're always happy. You made it onto the podium. When you're second, some people say, well, you know, that hurts because you're, you're so much closer to the win. In retrospect, was there anything that you, you think you could have done differently in the, in the closing stages of the race? Yeah, for sure, Jay. You know, if you look at the race again, you know, I started my sprint probably oh, 15th, 17th wheel, um, you know, coming into 500 metres to go. So I knew I was way too far back than what I should have been. So I gave these guys quite a few lengths head start. Yeah. So to change something, it would have, you know, it would have been closer to the mark in terms of closer to Ferrero and Yep. Taki was really on the front. So I started my, my sprint really long, as you know, like 400 and even 500 metres out. And then, um, you know, to get second from where I was, I was really happy. And, yeah. it, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people noticed that as well. So it was a good second, but, uh, you know, obviously a dream to be on the podium. But, um, yeah, it would have been nice to do some something a little bit different with the finish if I could have. Yeah, wow, excellent, excellent. And how about this weekend? You've got a favourite? You, you, you'll obviously be watching the race. Uh, Van Aert is in, in awesome form, as we saw last week at Strada. Um, how do you think it's going to unfold this weekend? Yeah, I think he'll be uh, hard to beat. You know, he'll probably play... Well, he's quite quick too, isn't he? So he's got, uh, he's got two cards. Really. He could go with the attacks if it unfolds, similar to Cancellara, who really dominated the race as well there. Because he had the strength to go with the attacks and then a bit of a sprint to, to finish off a small group, for example. So Van Aert, another one, Dark Horse, that I'm watching with really good form is Nizzolo, a local Italian. I think he's in really good form. He could be very close and one uh, sort of under the radar. Uh, Alaphilippe, you know, I hope Caleb Ewan does well. Um, I think he'll, he'll, he'll go close as uh, Caleb as he's getting older. His longer races are going to suit him more and more. So, the, the normal normal big names, mate, at the end of the monuments will be there, uh, elbowing and, you know, it should be... The, the best thing is uh, racing's back and it should be a good spectacle for, for the sport. 
Excellent. Okay, Alan Davis, thank you for this episode of This Cycling Life Racing Bites. We're going to be doing more of these. We're going to be talking to other former pros about uh, some of their, their fondest memories in the classics and, and, and other big, big races. So this is a, our kickoff session, but for the audience, certainly do stay tuned uh, for, more, for more of these to follow. Of course, if you have liked the video, please do give us the thumbs up, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, and again, Alan Davis, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome, Jamie. Absolute pleasure, mate.